So I think we'll just begin by taking questions. And that's what happened. Hi. Um, Bob Lee mentioned the reason you left China in 1982 was because you don't want to be censored and you want to be freed. Is, is it true? And uh, can you uh, tell me more about it? And the, um, what were the what were your personal reason to leave China in the 80s? And uh, are you feel for, for, for it now? Yes, I feel for it now. Of course, there is no absolutely free. Free always uh, uh, compare existence. The, the, um, uh, but, I, but I can answer your question because this is important. Uh, upside, I don't want to be censored in China. But, but, but I want to change it to, uh, I just want to get free, freedom to do my, to do my art. Because in China, when I was there, when I was there, there's now this such, such a word called censorship. The government gives you, uh, idea, can give you, uh, order, give you, uh, to tell you what you can do, what you cannot. Yes, so we call it propaganda. Yes, propaganda painting, and, uh, even, uh, no, uh, sometimes you can do a portrait, uh, like a landscape, uh, still life. It's not propaganda meaning. But, for any creative work, you have, you have to follow the government's idea. So we don't have this word called censorship. Because if you, if you do something yourself, you try something different with government. Usually, people censor themselves before the artwork sh ship outside, uh, ship out from the studio. And uh, to me personally, <clears throat> um, uh, you can tell from, from my early work now, uh, my 60 work or 50 work, I love painting, I love work uh, from a very early age. Uh, but since uh, after the Cultural Revolution, uh, it's not censorship, but your painting, uh, your work, criticized by other people uh, in the stupid way. Uh, you, 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 you can't just uh, do whatever you want. You have to concern other people's ideas. So always somebody behind you, your shoulder to tell you, no, 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 something wrong with it. No, no, you only can do this. So that's the basically, I can, uh, I can say this is a personal reason. To, to, to come to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was a picture with New York Times in this and on top of it, and then two people carrying a stretcher out, and it reminded me of Tiananmen Square when they were carrying the students out on stretchers. But it was interesting because the New York Times was 1985, but it was 1989. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? It was a New York Times. Yeah, it was a source. It was somebody who did tours. And two people were carrying a stretcher. There's a stretcher and there's a body. That thing is nothing to do with the gender. That's what it reminded me of. <laughs> I think that, that thing I made in 1985. Mm -hmm. oh. Five years earlier than. Right. So it had not. I don't know if you said the newspaper from 1985 to 1985. No, no. no. This is just a um, Maybe something happened in your daily life. If you look at it, you can read the newspaper. The war, the refugee, the political situation. I'm not even, I, I, I didn't really look forward as a five years ago. Another question. I have two other questions, so I don't want to hog up. Um, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about your experience during the Cultural Revolution, and if at the end you have time to comment on Hai Weiwei and censorship. And your experience during the yeah, Cultural yeah. Revolution, if it's not true. Oh, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, how long? Ten years. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. 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 It's also a really good film okay. in which he discusses. Uh, basically, I can tell about the Cultural Revolution. Uh, to me, it uh, uh, started. Uh, uh, no, I was 20 years old. I was really 20 in college. Started with uh, 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 very active during the Cultural Revolution. Because I, I, was, I trust Chairman Mao. I believe Chairman Mao. I read his book. His book is very, very idealism. Even very, very romantic uh, about the human being, about uh, people's life in the future, about uh, about everything. I believe him, but the cultural revolution itself changed my idea about the Mao, about the, about the Communist Party. So, uh, especially when I recognize after only after a few months, uh, so-called cultural revolution. But actually, people destroy culture. People put books together, fire. Uh, people uh, fire like, uh, foreign paintings. People die in the street. Kids die in the street. That's what I saw. Not from the video, not from the, not from the radio, not from the newspaper. I, I, how to say, I did this. So that's uh, fundamentally changed my idea. Uh, uh, what's the cultural revolution? Uh, what I'm going to do during the cultural wars. And, uh, and especially uh, after two, maybe two years, uh, I also recognize the uh, here's uh, Chairman Mao's, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, personality cut. I mean, the personality you, 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 um, you only respect bad. You only respect yourself. Yeah, what's the English word? Uh, you only worship, worship of Mao. Uh, worship, right? Yeah. Worship of Mao. Mao, Mao, Mao. Worship. Yeah. Worship. worship. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Mao worship. Uh, but Mao worship is not not only other people worship him. It's uh, his it's own. More, more, so, more. Yes, yes, yes. So that made me. That made me. Uh, Completely changed my idea, my feeling about cultural revolution and more. Because what he said is uh, for people, do everything for, pe for, for people. But uh, what he did was for himself, for his own uh, power struggle. And, uh, and of, of course, uh, so many de details happened. For example, I was sent to the countryside three years, uh, uh, but I also had a chance to travel to many, many places. Uh, but uh, while you travel to many, many places, you know more about the island. And uh, yeah, that's basically the mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, in the talking you stop to uh, do any Mao image uh, work after 19, uh, 1995, right? And uh, actually, I remember in the in, uh, 90s, there was a huge popularity of like a painting of Mao or something, uh, Mao-related artwork in China. And, but uh, I feel very interesting uh, about, uh, is that uh, you, you start to do uh, Mao-related artwork uh, since uh, 80, early 80s. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, artists in China, they also try to start, uh, they also start to do uh, some uh, artwork about uh, Mao too. So uh, what do you think is the, uh, what do you think is, uh, the difference between your, uh, your Mao works and uh, the uh, Mao work in, uh, from Chinese artists? So who live in, who live in China? Uh, basically, if anybody doing a Mao image in the Non cultural, cultural revolution way, I support. I thought it's interesting because that's, uh, it's not, first of all, it's not propaganda painting. Secondly, to make Mao, uh, doesn't like a guy. Uh, uh, but the difference between my Mao and their Mao, uh, basically is that I like my Mao image, uh, with message, uh, to repeat, to, to, uh, 
for representing my idea, not only uh, uh, funny, not only places in it, but with this message and political, political message. And also, uh, eventually, I hope my mouth series can make people rethink about the mouth. See, that's not a result. It's not my idea. Okay, what's the mouth? What's my, uh, my, uh, my concept of about the mouth? But I'm more interested to use to people, for people to have the idea to re examine the mouth. And the people have. Uh, uh, the, the, the chance, opportunity to read them, to criticize them, maybe in the future. Uh, uh, something is quite fascinating here is, is if uh, both artists in China and, and you, like uh, some, someone like you, artists uh, live, uh, live outside China, uh, you both found the same uh, figure. That is Mao to 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 carry uh, carry on in, in your art world. I think I think that's a very okay. interesting. Okay, I, I can add one more. It's not only Chinese people both side outside and inside China. Even people like Andy Warhol. Yeah. He didn't know even earlier than right. most Chinese artists. He didn't know in the 1970s. So that's a, that's all different. But one thing in common because Mao's image was too powerful. We, 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 we have nothing to paint, we have nothing to look at when I was in, in China. Uh, I can tell you, except the bathroom, most image everywhere. <laughs> Once happened, that, that's not kidding. What happened, well, we have the like, spring, spring cleaning, we clean the room. Our leader went to, the, uh, to check out how, uh, how clean the room. So in the center of the room, was China North Portrait. But he didn't see anything. He sat on the desk. He moved the painting, Chairman of Portrait, all the way to the city, to the edge of the city. He said, the most image only can put the highest position in the room. So you can imagine, that's a Chairman of So when I first have um, changed some little bit of the hairstyle of that, with the quick old spots, um, uh, American people ask me, we eat, we eat in a, a quick old one and a half million years. Nobody considered and its relationship with China Mao. So that's, that's an example to tell you how strongly as an image influences our generation. That, that's also why I said in a statement, I call it a statement, I said, uh, um, I believe in the image, uh, I believe in the power of the image, but I don't believe in the authority of the image. We did an article in uh, uh, one of our publications in the, in the, in the Asian American Art Center, uh, and uh, a number of artists, including yourself, was involved in uh, putting together um, uh, editing a, a portion, the, the best, the most important part of a book uh, that Gao Ming Lu uh, did on the history of uh, innovations happening in China, so that uh, he recorded every single exhibition, apparently, from what I understand, and so we took the gist of that uh, and published it, uh, so that a lot of information, like Hong Tu was saying, was withheld. The Chinese artists did not know what was going on in the rest of the world. But the decade before, from 1980 to 89, that is when tons of information began to come into China. And the last five years, uh, from um, uh, 85 to 89, is when a flood of information came in. And Chinese artists absorbed the whole history of modern art in the West. Um, so, at that point, there was a, a Gao Ming Lu uh, uh, um, then mounted an exhibition that was supposed to open in China, uh, in Beijing, and uh, 
all this new development was supposed to be exhibited. And uh, one of the artists uh, took a rifle and had a created an, an art piece of a telephone booth. Uh, and they shot into the telephone booth. And the government came, and I think this was just before or after the Tenement Square, um, and shut down the whole exhibition. So all of the new developments in China were shut down and went underground. Um, so that a lot of what was happening in China uh, was, would have to come out later. Um, I think that uh, uh, why Hong Tu is, one of the reasons why Hong Tu is celebrated is because he was the first to criticize Mao in this way. And a lot of artists in China afterwards followed suit. So a lot of people from China will come and interview Hong Tu because he's recognized for having done that, the, the original one. And what you have, unfortunately, is some Western critics who would say, oh no, Warhol did it first. He did Mao first. That just shows you why, I, why I'm important to you. Because it's only people like me, an Asian American uh, artist, curator, and critic, who's going to tell you that that uh, American critic doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. He doesn't know anything about the impact Hong Tu had in China, Hong Tu has on you as Americans, about how we feel about international relations. Uh, you know, we have a different perspective about what's going on and how to understand the context of his work. His, his work does need a context. He does need us to talk about his work and to, to come to an understanding about what is the real significance of it? What is the import? What is the point of view that we need to understand? And so I, I really feel that the dialogue between uh, all the different people here in the States is crucial to, and, and the artists who, like Hong Tu, who do new work, their work becomes the center because their work, it's the center of the dialogue because their work really expresses the heart of the issue. That's what their whole profession is about. For me, um, because of when I, when I see, you, you say the different with uh, those are uh, so-called contemporary Chinese artists, there is also that using a um, mouse into their artwork. It's complete, I, from my point of view, it's a different way, it's the concept that from initial, that idea from uh, Hong Tu, what is, uh, he is really self-experienced, all those uh, cultural revolution. And those are um, another generation for those uh, contemporary younger artists. They might catch the icon as more surface, but without deep into to understand those uh, 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 devastating the date in the cultural revolution period times, and also that to catch the real deep concept ideology that from Mao. Uh, for instance, the, uh, um, the acupuncture piece. If you care for read the words, the individual points, it really tell what tell you about the entire system of uh, uh, Mao built up of those uh, uh, central uh, authorities and uh, from those uh, red book that uh, Hong Tu catch of those uh, very important points about that uh, what he experienced and he comes here and how he reflects and uh, go uh, uh, went through all those um, hidden. Uh, periods and by through Mao and play with the Mao or play with the culture, new, new um, culture shock, the image or what he study into that his work. That is the um, really completely different with that to see from an artist but more deeply to see the Mao's piece. I, I just wanted to pick up on what Bob and Yuji were saying. I think what makes the difference between an Andy Warhol mouth and a Zhang Hung Tu mouth, from, from what I have seen and dealt with Hung Tu for the last 20 years, is that when I first saw the work, it was extremely clear to me that this was a purging for Hung Tu. 
that this wasn't just images of Mao. This was a 15-year, almost a purging and a vomiting of the image that was just pervasive in his mind when he sat down at his breakfast table and sat in front of the Quaker Oats. He saw Mao. That Quaker Oat image, he saw Mao because he was so brainwashed and the culture had been so brainwashed. So when Andy Warhol does Mao, that is a completely different notion. That is a pop art American notion of Mao, that has nothing to do with the experience of having been through the Cultural Revolution, having gone through the camps, having gone through all of that, that it is in his blood, in Hung Tu's blood, and it becomes this need to get it out. And I remember the day when the purging was over, and then the bridge came, and the, the piece in this room here that you all saw, it had the six different panels, and he looks at pop art, he looks at art from all the different Western artists' perspective, and for me, that was the bridge piece, and then came the San Shui series, but he almost could not have ended, he could not have finished Mao until it was out of his bloodstream, and so it, it's a very, very different notion from a Western perspective. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm about to China almost once a year, uh, mainly to see, mainly to see my family. Mm. in New York early time. It was uh, uh, organized by Mark, uh, Mark, Mark because uh, he is here, so it's very good to know that uh, during that time, what happened <laughs> during uh, that exhibit? Can you talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mark Moskin. Um, I run a graphic design firm now, but uh, back in the 80s and early 90s, I produced events, a lot of art events, a lot of music events, mostly in the big nightclubs in New York, also in galleries. And I had the opportunity to meet Hong Tu in uh, 1988. He, was he and I were introduced by a mutual friend of ours, uh, a fellow named Ling, Ling, Ling Lin Lin, who is uh, who was the first of the Chinese artists I met. He was actually brought here by my brother and his partner. And uh, Lin was unfortunately killed in 1990 in that infamous shooting in Times Square. But before that, Lin introduced me to a group of people called the Chinese Overseas, Un you get, correct me on this point too, Chinese United Overseas Artists Association. And so because I was working at that time with the Palladium, which was the biggest nightclub in the country, the most important nightclub in the country, about 7,000 people a night. Uh, and that club was very, very, it back was a different era. People back then, the nightclubs were used as vehicles to promote new and emerging art. It was an important part of what was being done. And when the Palladium opened, uh, in fact, uh, rooms were done on commission by Francesco Clemente, Keith Haring, uh, who else? Uh, Kenny Sharp, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and a few others. So eventually, uh, I got the opportunity to go to the people who ran the club and said to them, hey, can we do something really new and different that hasn't been done before? And what that thing is going to be is we're going to show emerging, the only really contemporary Chinese artists who were in the country and were making work. This work, for the most part, hadn't yet been shown in New York or anywhere else. So the nightclub gave me the opportunity. Uh, they covered all the expenses in a, in a room about the size of this room, too, right? Uh, to put up works by eight, eight artists. And uh, Hong Tu was one of them. And Lin Lin, of course, Ai Weiwei was one of them. 
and uh, I'm not going to read the whole list, you know, but you get the idea. And uh, and the, we put up the uh, the work, and we did an opening for the event. We had about 600 people at the opening, and one of them was actually the uh, reporter for the uh, the People's Daily who came down to the show but wasn't able to write it up because of the subject material of the show. Uh, that was, that was, I thought that was really cool, actually. <laughs> and uh, David Darcy, who unfortunately isn't here today, he reported on it. And that first night we had about 600 people, but the club liked the show so much that uh, they asked if we could, they could hire the show and leave it up for three months, an unheard of thing in this nightclub or any other one. And they actually rented for a small fee, a nominal fee, compared to uh, what Pfizer offered on to a little, little bit later. But uh, uh, they, we left it up for three months, and I can estimate that about 100,000 people saw that show, because, just by judging about how many people went through the club and about how many people went through that room called the Michael Todd room, which that was the VIP room of the club. Um, this is 1980, no, sorry, I can say 1988, October 1988. Um, and the, that club was extremely vital at the time. I remember I actually produced two events back to back on uh, succeeding nights, which I didn't normally do. The one was with Hong Tu at the art show. And then the next night was the tour party for UB40, <laughs> the, the reggae band that was playing a sold out show at Madison Square Garden because their hit uh, Red Red Wine. Uh, I think Red Red Wine was number one uh, at the time. So then the next night, we had a thousand people in there, the top people in the music industry, going through, hanging out, doing all sorts of naughty, bad things in, in this room, sur surrounded by you know, this work that no one in New York or anywhere else really had seen before. And I'm really happy that Hong Tu put up the back of the head, which was, which was one of Hong Tu's pieces in the show. Um, I'm talking a lot. I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying. Uh, do, do, do you all have any questions? Or is, is that what you'd like me to talk about? Yeah. No, yeah. Thank you very much. Mark just mentioned all six Chinese arts association. This is the earliest uh, Chinese group. Uh, uh, the first show was the show. Uh, Mark organism as the region like, uh, but also it was the only show. So anybody read about Chinese overseas Chinese art history? I just want to add that this real this was a fabulous opportunity for me. Back going back to the nineteen I'm old, but going back to the nineteen seventies, <laughs> I had studied about uh, I tried to study about the art programs in China under, under um, Marxism, Leninism, and under the, the Maoist interpretation of that. And the only things I could really get my hands on were like the Little, little Red Book and the talks at the Anon Forum. But I read everything I could get my hands on and wrote about it, but had no access at all to any of the artists or any of the people involved. So when I got to meet Lin Lin, it was like a revelation for me. It was like, wow, I finally get to meet somebody who was actually part of this, is what I thought was happening, actually what was happening. Turned out it was pretty close. Uh, but uh, what then, the, so then we did the Palladium Show, and the Palladium Show opened up all kinds of new opportunities in a lot of ways, including later on in 1993, I got to produce a one-man show for Hong Tu at another nightclub, the one that's uh, called Webster Hall, which is still in, in business today. And, uh, and right before that, we got Lin Lin, his first one-man show, at a Soho gallery, which may have been the first one-person exhibition by a contemporary Chinese artist in Soho, in, or maybe in New York, I don't really know. I think Ethan Cohen and Ben Sherald did some uh, before that, but that was 1992, I think, right? So, uh, no, sorry, 1990, 1990, no. No, 1990 was Lin Lin, 1993 was Hong Tu, but the Palladium show was 88. Okay, I just the Palladium got made into an NYU dormitory.
Who's very thin? Huge crust. Huge crust. So, Mark, was the original conception for the Palladium that it do both art and music? It was basically a, a, it was a nightclub. It was opened by Steve Cubell and Ian Schrager, you know, the, the Studio 54. The, the Palladium was opened by uh, Rubel and Schrager, who had done Studio 54, and they on purpose wanted to make the biggest splash that they could in an era in which these kind of venues had an importance that they don't have anymore. They had an importance socially, and they had an importance culturally. The uh, your question was about what did they really open it to do, and they opened it to do multiple things. First of all, it was a social cent social center for all kinds of different people to come and meet, which is part of what I really liked about putting on the, ch the show of the Chinese artists, because we got all different kinds of people together. It wasn't just in with one group, it was everybody. And uh, that, would, to me, was always really, really important, to, to let all the, the, cross, the cross thing going on. Um, and then, to answer, continue answering the question, but the, of course there was a huge top of Top light dance floor with a Richard Long sound system that would, you know, blew everybody out the door and, and sounded unbelievably clear. You don't find anything like this today. Very, very expensive. Uh, it's where Club MTV was filmed. I don't know if you ever, some of you here may be old enough to remember that. It was the, the dance music show on, on TV. Yes. Yes, that's right. It's a UB40 question here. Who do I think was better? Well, I'm friends with I'm friends with Ali, so I, I'm going to say Ali from you, basically. <laughs> Thank you. I had a question about the reception of your work. I think it's incredibly powerful, and I can see why at the Queen's Museum, I mean, it's the most diverse place in the world, it would be received very welcomed. Um, but you mentioned that there were traveling shows across the country and there's that censorship of the Last Supper piece. Um, I mean, I wonder how it's, how your work's been received across the country where there may not be as much diversity and maybe not as much open-mindedness. And then another little question about the McDonald's and Coca-Cola piece. Is that more of a critique or a welcoming acceptance of that whole like, fast food culture? <laughs> uh, basically, nothing happened after, after, uh, you know, after watching the uh, censorship. Because uh, uh, the same show, uh, for example, the last time we were also uh, showing the uh, Cleveland, um, because I still have the communication to use this image. And, uh, uh, nothing happened. Uh, for the quick ones, uh, once I uh, showed, that's, that's later, maybe early, early year 2000, um, in the little rapid, a small town, uh, so the quick ones. But I didn't know there was a, one of the uh, headquarters of, of a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> they have no them. They, 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 they bought one. They bought two pieces. Of it. <laughs> it becomes a collection. So people here still have this kind of humor. People not really uh, too much con concerned about the political meaning. Uh, and uh, to talk about the political meaning, I, I still want to add one more word uh, for uh, Max to talk about radio show. Because one thing, uh, one reason I thought it interesting to put my quick uh, in radio because uh, uh, as part of our brainwashed education in China, we were taught nightclub called Ye Dong Hui. Nightclub is a typical bourgeois lifestyle. I thought for the most image in this kind of uh, place, so it's kind of big contrast, but also very, very, uh, 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 the show, the Tenement Square show, of um, we had maybe the, the original show had a lot of hundreds of people in it, but the traveling show maybe we had 150 people in it, including uh, Home Two's um, Last Supper, and uh, it traveled to four or five other places. One of them was Flint, Michigan. 
uh, you know what's going on in Flint. Um, but at that time, Flint was uh, just coming out of um, General Motors having shut down a major factory. And there, so there was a lot of people living there. Some of them were artists, and they had an art organization, and they sponsored uh, the Tiananmen Square show to travel there. And uh, th these artists organized uh, uh, lots of uh, school kids, uh, high school kids, to come and see the show and have a lecture and talk and educated about um, what happened in China in 1989. Now, this tour was in 1994, so it was several years afterwards that um, the children were uh, given this uh, education. And because of these artists, uh, who were you know, so appreciative of the show, uh, they received it very well. They received Hong Chu's work very well. But that's partly because you, know, you have this, this presence of artists there who are going to set the stage for that, that community to welcome the show. So, um, this has been a really, really rich conversation, and especially thank you to our special guest stars, who very knowledgeable folks who joined us from the audience. I just wanted to um, end on a final note that sort of brings the conversation up to today, and I wanted to ask Lucia and Bob Lee about the work that you do um, as curators and as an activist, um, working with so culturally specific art and how that's changed for both of you over time and what do you see as um, sort of how the work that you do has evolved um, or not and what the legacy of artists like Hong Tu has done for um, Chinese and Asian American art. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm supposed to be retired now, uh, you know, after 25 years of exhibiting artists and my, my wife having spent 15 years uh, creating the first Asian, one of the first Asian American contemporary dance companies. Since 74, we've been working in the community uh, with uh, the generosity of the uh, state funders who are very happy to give us peanuts to do what we do. Um, and so to see some of our artists uh, succeed in the way that Hong Tu has is, uh, is just very vindicating and very, very uh, important for us to recognize that you know, it, it was vital, it was important for us to be there and support those artists. Um, now we, we try to stay active online and so you can see our website where about 10% of the artists we've exhibited are there. You can see them, and it's a professional archive, so it's connected to archives around the world, so other scholars can get access to the artists that we've exhibited. Um, so, um, and so we continue to try to support artists. However, I did want to connect for you uh, this painting that's behind me, uh, this lovely, gorgeous little painting, and the painting I pointed to you before of the back of the head. Uh, and to let you know that uh, you may feel that you're comfortable, that now you understand Hong Tu and you've got a sense of completion, his beginning and now. Um, but uh, what's really here is on the horizon. This is obviously a very creative soul. And it's what he's gonna do next that you should be aware of, you should be waiting for, you should be anticipating, because He's a, a remarkable person. And, um, and it started, to me, in my mind, with that back of the head. He has so much integrity, and he's going to bring it to us. Not only to Chinese people, but to us. Uh, you know, Václav Havel, in 1991, 92, uh, came to the United States because he's a theater person, but he's the first art person elected to a country country's not there anymore, but part of it is. And Václav Havel was quoted in the New York Times as saying, you know, uh, we have an assumption that uh, objective knowledge is uh, totally, what do, I can't quote him exactly, but totally managed 
by uh, our control. We can take objective knowledge and do that. And he said that assumption from the Renaissance on is now dead. And the modern age that we live in is a time when we are trying to find a new basis for what we consider to be what is the fundamental aspects of what's real. And he was saying that we need to go back to subjectivity. We need to go back and find how we feel. And you can see it in the New York Times, the full quote. I'm sorry I can't give you the exact quote. But uh, Hong Tu is working on this kind of a problem. He's, we are embedded, all of us are embedded in this issue of what and who we are today. How do we think of ourselves? And it's because of his tremendous sense of mission, of purpose, and by his artistic life, is that uh, he's going to give us a response to that. And it's the future. It's the future for us and for, you know, what comes later. And that little painting right behind us, that little monkey, he's going to answer the question. That monkey poses. I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> um, the exhibition I curated starts from very cold. Usually, you start from so called that the relationship between the, the human being of us to our the, the, the environment surrounding us. In my back to so-called the nature, nature, the real environment, or the how artists that um, response or dialogue to the environment of that what happened at that time, and uh, uh, those exhibi exhibition that I choose that um, to show before um, gradually change from the so-called um, uh, the landscape, the nature, uh, the beauty of the nature and then to reflect to the human mind, the whole beauty of the human mind, and how we concern about the environment, our environment. The, 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 uh, the last year that I did, the so-called the, um, when I see um, uh, a meeting that happened to, to, to everybody, the sci scientific um, perspective to concern the, the raising the temperature or the, uh, uh, the global warming issue that I, I did that before, that mm -hmm. last year, and then also to the to this exhibit, um, uh, my essay in this book is also focused on the so-called environmental sensor and sensor today. Then, in a way that I prefer to see, so the way that uh, in where we live, the social. Um, the social issues, um, the, the problem that happened in our day, not only about way uh, the human, and also the, the people who are managed that entire society or country, or the uh, different cultures. So then, the, this is the, the one that when I look to, the, uh, to Hong Tu's work, then through this very rare retrospective exhibition, in, at the beginning I was uh, a little um, hesitate to show that such a, like a wide scale exhibit, but I uh, prefer say, uh, to choose something to respond to New York. But uh, uh, later, another um, way after this class, then we thought that Hong Tu himself that is uh, 70 years old now, then all his path of, from China and across the uh, continent are really reflect to what we cover a different subject that I concern in a long time. But the, uh, when, when we see the exhibit, we don't feel that it's, if you don't start from the, the background, say Zhang Hong to use this name to cover overall the exhibit, you thought that this is a probably belong to maybe five or six artists' artwork, because not, none of them from the surface or appearance to see the artwork, you thought that that is the, belong to the same artist. But uh, if you care for work, that there's actually have a thread that really, really 
very, very um, uh, uh, well connected to individual piece. And then the work that in the six uh, galleries, actually they are di dialogued to each other and also reflect the, the something, the subject that we concern. And then we, through this work, and then he's agreed that he's passed to see, to, to reinvestigate or reevaluate what we see on this, this world. That what I think, think and what I, what I uh, uh, expect that we uh, get a really good uh, response from all of us and um, all the audience. Okay, and I think with that, we'll wrap up. Thanks to all of you for coming, and thanks again to Lucia and Bob and Hong Tu um, for delivering this wonderful dialogue today. Thank you. Thank you.